the longitude problem was simply the problem that it was relatively easy for ships at sea to work out how far north and south they were and almost impossible for them to work out how far east or west they were. What they needed were better astronomical measurements, better clocks, better techniques. And the penalties of failure at solving those problems were lethal. I'm Simon Schaffer, I'm an historian of science in Cambridge University and I'm the principal investigator in a new project to look at the history and the experience of the Board of Longitude. So the government in 1714 passed an act called the Longitude Act which established a Board of Longitude, a government organisation which would administer a prize, think the X factor, only much more money and much more important, which would reward anyone who could solve the longitude problem, the problem of detecting how far east or west a ship was at sea. We've organized a large project funded uh, by the Arts and Humanities Research Council to make sense of one of the Board of Longitude's most important legacies, which is a vast archive of manuscripts, letters, documents, and objects, clocks and telescopes, which exist both in Cambridge and at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. Cambridge University Library is one of the greatest archival resources in the world for the history of the sciences. It holds all the manuscripts of the Royal Greenwich Observatory and amongst those survive all the papers of the Board of Longitude. The Board of Longitude was an extremely public organization. It featured in newspaper reports and magazines, in cartoons and satires. People took the piss and they also wrote begging letters. So a lot of the incoming mail to the Board of Longitude preserved in Cambridge is mail from people about whom we would not otherwise know at all. These are people who belong to one of the most important traditions in British history which is the extreme eccentric. The Board of Longitude has had a, a pretty bad career in history. Either it's been forgotten or it's been condemned. It's been forgotten because I think we don't like remembering how important the state is in promoting science and technology in British history. And we ignore or condemn the Board of Longitude because there's a hero in this story called John Harrison who has been the subject of a best-selling book and a superb film. My name is Richard Dunn. I'm curator of the history of navigation at the National Maritime Museum. I guess for this project, uh, one of our aims is to look at the archives with the objects. So when you go to the Board of Longitude papers, you'll have discussions of very specific objects the most famous being Harrison's famous chronometers. And so looking at the papers and at the objects we have here, you, you can bring those stories together. Regarding John Harrison, obviously the, the key things we have are the four marine time, timekeepers, now called H, H's one to four, um, which are his uh, successive attempts to uh, produce a, a timekeeper that will go on a ship at sea and of which H4 really is the successful prototype for all marine chronometers. 
one of the things we're doing uh, in cataloging them is taking them apart and looking at them in great detail, which can, can help give an alternative viewpoint to, to the histories that have already been written in taking apart H1, his first uh, marine timekeeper, for instance. Um, one of the things that becomes obvious is that, that there were several workmen involved in making it, so it's not just a case of Harrison being the, the lone genius working on his own. I think in British culture we have two related but apparently contradictory stories about where innovation and triumph comes from. One story, which is the story that everybody knows about John Harrison and his clocks, is that it's the solitary genius on his own or her own, battling against bureaucracy, ignored, discriminated against, who eventually wins against the odds. And then there's the opposite story, which is that British innovation, the mobilization of collective action and rational planning make all the difference. What's fascinating about the longitude story from 1714 to 1828 is that it combines both aspects. I think one of the key things about this project and about the Board of Longitude story is that it's not just about Harrison and his timekeepers uh, versus the lunar distance method and that's been the traditional story. There are, there are all sorts of other avenues that, that it goes down. One of the things that the Longitude Prize and the Board of Longitude did was to encourage inventions of all sorts. Uh, so the development of the sextant, you know, which was a, a staple marine instrument for the next two and two and a half centuries, um, really comes out of that longitude problem. We have an enormous navigational instrument collection uh, and collection of other items uh, of, of prints uh, and maritime uh, objects that relate explicitly to the longitude story, to the development of instruments for navigation at sea, uh, also to the voyages of exploration that the Board of Longitude was involved in, like the James Cook voyages. As far as we know, the Board of Longitude, which was abolished by a Conservative government in 1828, um, was abolished not because it had already done its job, it had already done its job 40 years earlier, but because it was too expensive and too complex. We need to find out exactly why this great institution was stopped, because it'll tell us a great deal about the relationship between science and politics, an issue which matters a lot now. One of the most pressing, urgent problems in public science and science policy in Britain today is that we don't know what to do and we don't know what to think when scientists fight with each other. Whether it's MMR or climate change, the public sphere has a bad time when experts seem to disagree. The longitude problem is a spectacular story of expert disagreement, public involvement and government intervention. If we can see how what worked in fact worked, and if we can get behind the scenes, because that's the privilege of historians, then we have lessons to teach about better ways to think about public disagreement and public science policy and I think that will be a huge payoff of the project we're starting now.